Navajo Reservation in New Mexico. I work as the coordinator of the Native American Student Center. On behalf of the Native American Student Center and the Native American Studies Program under the direction of Dr. Sandy Dixon, I want to thank President Colvin for her efforts to recognize our tribal community both on and off campus. Today's convocation marks the beginning of a new tradition where we will open our gathering with a Native American blessing from a tribal elder. Also, this week on Friday, we recognize and honor California Native American Day, which is formally recognized by the state of California. You can read about it in the program. With a donor's generous gift this past May, we established the Native American Pipeline to College and Pathways to Graduation Program. The, thank you. The funds help us to financially support our Native American college students to create a mentoring program and to have an elder scholar in residence at Cal Poly Pomona. We welcome Ms. Glory Tisla as our elder scholar in residence from Sherman Indian High School. Also, lastly, save the date of Saturday, May 14, 2016, when we will bring back the annual Intertribal Powwow to Cal Poly Pomona. We certainly have many blessings in the future. Now, here to offer blessing to our fall conference, I am honored to introduce and welcome Mr. Kim Marcus. VA, Kim Marcus, Nanetu Kim Marcus. Follow. be able to open up when I was seven, 1978, I was a student here. To have this open up for you is a great honor. I have Dr. Dixon, Mr. Irvin Harris to come help stand with me to represent our Native American community, to honor our people, the first people that we sit on the land that we inhabit. I'd like to ask if we could stand. We'd like to open up with our blessing. The great one. We call him God. Good morning. Nawuki Ifaka. Of Puche Vekatam. Kempo a piba mukukulo wana maana a nuchia kempo a piba. This morning I said I'm going to open up to recognize and respect our Creator, Great Spirit. We're going to blow tobacco as it has been done since the beginning of time. Nukuka sum iba mukuka hakusi iba amakishamna. We would open up before we would enter to our ceremonial house. For you, I would do this. I'd like to have our Indian nations to represent us here, and we'd like to offer this.
Ms. Jim Nashkaway, you can go ahead and be seated. Thank you very much for your respect. It's a beautiful day to open up this. I'd like to sing one blessing song, and this is the songs where you inhabit it right here. These songs are ancient, ancient, ancient songs. So uh, please, if you would record them, that would be great. This is my grandfather's song that sang the songs of these areas. Toro mi patono mi pa mi patono mi patono mi pa tono mi patono mi pa mi patono mi patono mi rona tono mi pa tono mi pa no tono no mi pa na tono mi pa tono mi pa tono mi pa tono mi pa mi patono no mi rona sakana ponene sakana ponete panlo te ha pa e o ke ne ponene hayo ne tono mi pa no, no, mi pa, mi pa, to, no, mi ro na, saka na, pone ne, saka na, pone ne, pan lo te o ha pa, te o ke ne, pone ne, hayo ne, to, no, mi pa. Everybody, long time ago, there was hundreds of us, like we're sitting here in a ceremonial house, they would say, we ti ako, hear, hear now. Everybody, we ti ako, hear, hear now. Thank you. We honor this with you. We pay respects to you. And on behalf of our Indian community, we appreciate you teaching our children, our young ones, to educate them, to open their minds. So for this, this is for you. I wish you well for a great year. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dixon, Mr. Irving, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Oh, come on. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, great. Well, welcome to 2015-16 Fall Convocation. My name is Rachel Dominguez, this year's Staff Council President. I would like to especially welcome all the new uh, staff and faculty to the Cal Poly campus today. So if you could take some time and stand if you're new, so we can give you a warm welcome. Let's do that. Wow. That's really bright. Well, I, I look forward to seeing everyone on campus uh, at some point in time, and especially at maybe some of our future staff council events. A uh, few that we have upcoming are the um, Staff Emeritus, which honors those staff with uh, 10 years or more of service who have retired. And then we have the Amelia Hammond Scholarships, which Staff Council awards four scholarships for those who are continuing their education. Uh, to learn more about these events and other future events, please visit our website. Immediately following Fall Convocation is our first event, the Service Awards Ceremony, acknowledging staff for their years of service, which also includes staff from Foundation, ASI, and our famous Cal Poly Pomona Federal Credit Union. Um, while Staff Council hosts these events, uh, we do have the support from the President's Office and also from Foundation. So what I have to say today to everyone is Let's move forward towards a great year of successes, achievements, and yes, challenges. Challenges are what make life interesting. Overcoming them is what makes it meaningful. So welcome back, everybody, on behalf of Staff Council. At this time, I would like to introduce and welcome ASI President Julian Herrera. Good morning, everyone. My name is Julian Herrera. I'm a fifth year communication major with an emphasis in public relations. And I'm honored, <clears throat> excuse me, 
and I'm honored to be here today as Associate Students Incorporated, Cal Poly Pomona's student body president. My goal is to support ASI's model, students serving students. And with the assistance of our ASI Vice President, Diana Asensio. <laughs> student government and the support of ASI staff will be doing just that by first providing students with the involvement and volunteer opportunities. Studies show that students who are involved in activities with their campus community perform better academically. And through the programs and services offered by ASI, we can support our students by providing those opportunities for involvement. Next, we hope to lead the charge in advocating for students' needs, such as tackling higher education challenges, supporting access to afford affordable and quality education, creating initiatives and policies to better serve the campus, and of course, lob lobbying at local and state government levels. But, ab but above all, we will serve as a collective voice on behalf of the students to enhance their experience here at Cal Poly Pomona. I'm looking forward to working with students, Dr. Coley, the university administration, faculty and staff to create a positive difference for our students and fully support the educational mission of Cal Poly Pomona. Thank you for, for supporting ASI student government and my role as ASI student body president. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sepp Eskandaya. Thank you, Julian and Diana. We all appreciate your service as student leaders on this campus. Good morning and welcome to the 2015-2016 academic year. This year marks 77 years since Cal Poly since Cal Poly Pomona's humble beginning back in 1938 as an all-male San Dimas located Voorhees unit of California Polytechnic State College in San Luis Obispo. 59 years since 1956 when faculty, staff, and students moved to this current location, then called the Kellogg Campus. 54 years since 1961 when women first enrolled at Cal Poly Pomona. 49 years since 1966, when Cal Poly Pomona became an independent campus, known as California State Polytechnic College Kellogg Campus, and 43 years since 1972, since Cal Poly Pomona achieved university status, now called California State Polytechnic University of Pomona. Today, Cal Poly Pomona is a mature, comprehensive university with a nationally and internationally recognized programs and a reputation that is the envy of other CSU campuses and indeed institutions outside of, outside of the CSU. What makes Cal Poly Pomona so special is all of you, faculty, staff, and administrators who work hard every day to make this place a noble educational center of excellence for our students. Cal Poly Pomona students love this campus and this is due to how all of you faculty, staff, and administrators interact with them, teach them, guide them, help them, care for them, and keep them safe on a daily basis. I'm proud not only to be a member of this wonderful academic institution, but I also humbly stand before you as a product of this campus. I'm Sepp Eskandari, Chair of the Academic Senate and Professor of Biological Sciences. I have the honor of serving alongside 38 dedicated senators to represent the faculty voice on all academic matters on this campus. High on the Senate's list of priorities are academic policies and processes related to semester conversion. As we prepare for our historic transition to a semester-based calendar, we must ensure that our programs are up-to-date and relevant to the challenges that our students face in the workforce and in graduate and professional programs. Our curricula and processes need to be solidly grounded in tradition, but also flexible and forward-looking to allow us to keep pace with a rapidly changing educational, intellectual, technological, and global landscape. It takes all of us to create the best learning and maturation conditions for our students. Faculty who have a passion for training the next generation of students 
and are up to date and are intellectually, creatively active, productive, and vibrant. Staff members who love Cal Poly Pomona and our students and are well trained through uh, on the job, learn by doing, as well as through professional development opportunities. And administrators who have big hearts coupled to a collective vision to channel their talents and skills to create conditions that allow faculty, staff, students to do the best, most creative, most efficient, and most productive work they can do. Working closely with one another and in a collaborative, cooperative, and synergistic manner will not only create the smoothest transition for our students, but will also create curricula and processes that accelerate Cal Poly Pomona's progress along its path to excellence. Our curricula must have a fine balance between specialized courses and a broad general education. Getting this balance right will ensure that our graduates can use their specialized training to solve practical and, practic uh, practical and intellectual problems that they can draw from their broad general education to carefully examine moral and ethical dilemmas that our students not only have respect and tolerance for diversity, but indeed see the beauty and collective advantage brought about by diversity of race, religion, culture, ethnic background, color, physical ability, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, as well as diversity of ideas and creative expressions. While we have many challenges ahead of us, I'm confident that we'll rise above it because I know in my heart that above all else, we're all united by our love and passion for our students. It is also a new day for Cal Poly Pomona. We have a new president who will guide the campus to formulate a refreshed and focused vision for Cal Poly Pomona. It'll take all of us working together, hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder, and with interlocking goals to lay a solid foundation for a better future for the next generation of students faculty, staff, and administrators. It is now my privilege, honor, and distinct pleasure to welcome our president, Cal Poly Pomona's sixth president, President Soraya Cole. Well, good morning. good morning. Thank you, Rachel and Sepp, for the welcome messages and the introduction. I look forward to working with the Academic Senate and Staff Council this year. And in fact, I'd like to take a moment to recognize the members of the Academic Senate. All members, would you please stand? All members of the Academic Senate. Thank you. Thank you for your investment in the institution's advancement and the service that you provide. We appreciate the contributions of the Staff Council. Would the officers of Staff Council also stand? Thank you for your commitment and contributions to the university as well. We're always proud to see our students assuming leadership roles, and I want to congratulate again our new ASI President, Julian Herrera, and Vice President, Diana Asensio. I look forward to working with them and all of ASI this year. I want to thank our special guest, Mr. Kim Marcus, for the blessing. We are honored by your presence and your gift to the campus. What a wonderful way to begin our first full academic year together. This year, our campus is welcoming a visiting American Council on Education fellow. The purpose of the fellowship is for individuals to gain broad knowledge about institutional operations, as well as specific understanding in defined areas. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Monique Snowden, who is the Vice President for Planning and Institutional Effectiveness at Fielding Graduate University. Dr. Snowden will divide her time between Cal Poly Pomona, EDUCAUSE, and her home institution. 
She will be especially interested in our work in government and external relations, strategic initiative setting, and implementation and leadership styles. Dr. Snowden, will you please stand so we may welcome you. I would be remiss if I had not take a moment to thank everyone at Kellogg West for providing breakfast, and to the Bronco Student Center, the Events Office, Media Vision, Public Affairs, and the President's Office for assisting with the arrangements for our annual conference. Thank you for your support. And speaking of support, I want to recognize my new Chief of Staff, Gary Hamilton, my Executive Assistant, Paulette Bloomberg, along with Francine Ramirez, my scheduler and presidential assistant who had previously served in the interim role. Also new to the role of the Title IX coordinator is Linda Hoos. She previously served as the manager overseeing compliance of equal employment opportunity and civil rights programs at the LA Transportation Authority. Will these members of the President's Office please stand and be recognized? My husband, Ron, is unable to join us this morning. He's at that other university down the, the road. But he will be at the reception this afternoon. He and I extend our thanks to all of you for having made us feel so welcome. We are excited and proud to call this our home. I distinctly remember this time last year when I was introduced by President Ortiz as the incoming president of Cal Poly Pomona. Being in the CSU system for 30 years, I have known that this is a special institution and was so excited about joining you and leading this university. And now, almost a year later, I have even more passion and affection for Cal Poly Pomona. Every day, I learn something new about the heart, the spirit and the intellect of the people who work here and the dedication and aspirations of the students who learn here. You may recall that we came together this past January and I delivered my first speech as your new president. I titled my message, My Journey to You and Our Journey Together. And in highlighting my journey to you, I gave you a glimpse into my background, including my baby pictures, my family life in North Carolina, my undergraduate years, and my professional growth and development, including service at Cal State Fullerton and CSU Bakersfield. I provided insight into the evolution of my beacon statement, which is to remain student-centered, faculty and staff focused, and community-minded and I indicated the principles guiding my leadership. In my initial message our journey to, about our journey together, I shared the elements of my vision, and now I wish to expand upon that. I believe that Cal Poly Pomona should be among the leading polytechnic universities in the nation, preparing a highly diverse student population for the STEAM fields, which include science, technology, tourism, engineering, agriculture, arts, and mathematics. Our identifiable signature programs will springboard students into successful careers and graduate education. Our strong teacher-scholar model including our focus on interdisciplinary research and cross-disciplinary activities will be linked with the community and industry. Through their engagement with the faculty and industry partners, our students will be at the forefront of problem solving and the quest for innovative global solutions. We recognize the high demand for a Cal Poly Pomona education with nearly 48,000 applications this year, 
and 2,700 new freshmen and 2,400 transfer students beginning in a few days. We will provide a quality and engaging educational experience that makes clear our desired learning goals. We will be intentional about setting expectations while also being mindful of timely graduation. Most importantly, we will meet and exceed the graduation rate target and close the gap for underrepresented students. Working collaboratively across the divisions of academic and student affairs to build upon our success towards these goals is our new provost, Dr. Silva Alva, who joins us from Cal State Northridge, where she served as a dean for seven years. Dr. Alva, please stand and be recognized. Collaborating with Dr. Alva this year is Ms. Kathy Street, who serves as our Acting Vice President for Student Affairs and previously served as our Associate Vice President for Enrollment Services. Kathy, please stand and be welcomed. It is my hope that together we can formulate a strategy that will provide students with a plan for success that focuses beyond their career interest and goals. It will include leadership development, community enrichment, and will guide our students to find their place within the global environment. We will provide the skills, knowledge, and values that we believe are essential to live, work, and have meaning. Through sustainable and innovative solutions, Cal Poly Pomona will be recognized as an exceptional institution in every area. Student development and achievement, faculty excellence, staff excellence, and operational and organizational excellence. And speaking of operational and organizational excellence, Dr. Ben Quillen, who served as the Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer in the CSU Chancellor's Office will be serving as the Acting Vice President and CFO for Administrative Affairs. He will join fellow cabinet members John McGuthrie, our Vice President for Information Technology and CIO, and Paul Story, the Executive Director of the Cal Poly Pomona Foundation, in examining operational effectiveness. Ben is not here this morning, but please join me in acknowledging John and Paul. Please stand. And in talking about our journey together, I use the image of our having understandably reached a plateau after adapting to drastic budget reductions over a number of years. The result of these reductions were evident. Gaps in faculty and staff hiring, continued growth in deferred maintenance and related cost, salary depression, rising student tuition, and the lack of needed upgrades in academic space and technology. And in order to access the impact on our campus and to hear from you, I launched listening tours across the university. Since January, I have completed 44 tours, visiting 37 academic departments, seven administrative units, and have engaged with more than 478 faculty and staff. I have also met with numerous student clubs and organizations and the full leadership of ASI. But I am not done. I will complete my tours of academic programs and all of the units this academic year. As I've listened to you, these are just a few of the themes emerging from our conversations. First, we must build upon and invest in the expansion of academic excellence. The team of deans are leaders in this area, and joining them this year are two new interims. They are Dr. Cheryl Warwick in the College of Business Administration and Dr. Nancy Hurlbut in the College of Education and Integrative Studies. 
Please welcome both of them into their new roles. Please stand. There are other emerging themes. We must improve graduation rates and continue increasing the diversity of our students, faculty, and staff profile. We need to promote greater interdisciplinary work and reduce our historical departmental college and divisional silos. There should be more hiring in areas of greatest demonstrated need. We must invest in faculty and staff development and be intentional about our support of faculty research and grant seeking. Finally, we need to find ways to reduce paperwork, streamline operations, and improve our facilities. So with these needs and opportunities as a backdrop, we can ill afford to remain on the plateau. Instead, we need to begin our journey forward. And as we examine our trek ahead, we recognize that there are external factors on the horizon that will affect our journey. And I just want to mention three. First, there will be increased need for access to education against a backdrop of lagging support for higher education. A basic contributing factor to social and economic mobility in our society has been education. In 2000, the United States ranked second in the world in its share of the population with a college degree. In 2014, we ranked 12th. The lack of a college education is one of the contributing factors to the growing income inequality in our society. With a growing chorus of voices emanating from urban communities, and pleas from our rural and depressed economic hubs, we hear growing calls for our nation to collectively build pathways out of impoverishment. We know that education is the defining factor in personal growth, economic advancement, and improved quality of life. Given the backdrop of lagging support for higher education, what is the future of funding for public higher education in California? How will we support upward and intergenerational mobility? I was delighted by the bipartisan support this year for additional revenue to the CSU for enrollment growth. We applaud the governor, the state legislature, and our chancellor. And while we appreciate the additional increased revenue, we need to recognize that the allocation does not get us back to pre-recession levels prior to 2008. Yet, our campuses continue to grow and the achievement gap continues to widen. In our journey forward, we will be faced with determining future growth scenarios and their implications for access. How to best utilize current resources and secure new non-state revenue. A second external factor is the increased public discourse and review of institutions, taking into account student achievement, graduation rates, and the added value of the college degree. In many ways, these are the same things we care about and discuss among ourselves internally but our analysis and our timetable do not necessarily coincide with the public's. Thus, we must be proactive and prepare to engage in and help shape the discourse about student success and university achievements. Third, college students of the not too distant future expect technology to be integrated into the learning environment and in the services of the university. The technology of choice, of course, are smartphones. In fact, students view mobile phones, laptops, and tablets as a natural part of their educational and campus experience. But we also know that the touch screen of technology cannot substitute 
for the touching word or the encouragement of a faculty member or staff. It cannot replace the mentorship or guidance of a seasoned professor or a caring staff member. Our journey will include finding the optimal integration of technology into the learning environment and creating ease of use services that accommodate our students' busy lives. And as we deal with the external factors, our journey forward also requires us to look internally, including re-examining and reaffirming our identity. There is a concept in psychology regarding identity development that suggests that in absence of proactive self-definition, others will ascribe an identity that may not be appropriate or accurate. During the listening tours, several of you commented on the need to be intentional in distinguishing ourselves. I believe that it must start with a clear statement of the differentiated elements of a polytechnic university. We're one of only two in the state and less than a dozen in the country. And we readily note that we have a learn by doing approach. But what does that really mean? Is it hands-on education? Is it being tech savvy? Is it the mix of academic programs and or the ways in which we engage with concepts and ideas? Is it apparent? Or has it become a default phrase? In an era of service learning, community engagement, internships, and undergraduate research across all CSU campuses and in other colleges and universities across the country, how does our brand of learn by doing differ? How do our disciplines reflect that educational philosophy? What are the implications for faculty hiring? And how is our 21st century polytechnic education distinguished from the other 21 non-polytechnic CSUs? I believe answering these questions are essential to crafting our identity as we continue to advance on the national stage of higher education institutions and pursue community, regional, national, and international partnerships. And while readying for our journey forward, it is also the perfect time for us to thoughtfully weigh and answer several fundamental questions within the context of this new environment. The American Council on Education posed three questions facing higher education today. Who are we going to teach and serve? What are we going to teach and study and what methods will work best? And how are we going to pay for it? Underlying these questions is a fundamental need to first reaffirm, recommit, or re-envision our direction as an institution. Does our vision capture our direction for the next climb, over the next five years, or in the next 10? Are we aspirational? And does our vision connect with your hopes? Does it connect with the demographics and needs of this state and nation? And does our distinctiveness flourish through our innovative and unique approach to education? To define our collective way forward, we will engage in a university-wide strategic planning process with expected completion by the end of this academic year. The process will be well represented with a broad range of internal and external stakeholders, and you will hear more about the details in the coming weeks. The outcome of this process will be the development of campus-wide goals and objectives with annual measures of progress to determine whether we are on course, whether we are moving towards our defined destination, and whether we have the appropriate budget plans needed to support our direction. Emanating from this process will be department and unit-specific priorities that support the achievement of our goals. 
incorporated into this process will be a campus master plan that examines our facilities, especially our academic space, in conjunction with growth projections. We will conduct an assessment of our campus footprint, including capacity for growth. As it is appropriate, we will develop a strategic agenda for revenue generation, including public-private partnerships and a significant increase in fundraising. Heading our fundraising division and our final cabinet member is our new Vice President for University Advancement, Bedford McIntosh. Bedford, please stand. A necessary part of our strategic discussion will center on how we will use the former property of the Lannerman Developmental Center, which has been renamed Campus South. The possibilities for developing this area are nearly limitless, with enormous opportunities to enhance education and develop public-private partnerships that benefit our students and faculty. Campus South will also have significant benefits to the economic growth of the city and this region. I welcome you to share your thoughts and ideas when we begin the planning process. Student success is certainly another component of our strategic discussion. It is at the core of what we do. It's why we reconvene at the start of each academic year it's why we review our goals, our strategies, and processes. Strengthening student success will be essential in our visioning process. While our focus on student success aligns with the external discussion in higher education at the federal, state, and in the CSU, student success is already embedded in who we are and what we do. I'm proud to have discovered on my listening tour the excellence and commitment of our faculty and staff to engineer an extraordinary experience for our students. Our challenge now is to encourage greater coordination and collaboration across our various divisions, programs, and units. We must learn from one another and determine how we can institutionalize our successes. Our semester conversion initiative offers an ideal opportunity to look at the integrated systems of alerts, monitoring, and communicating with our 24,000 students. This is a unique opportunity to become more data-driven in our approach and to explore promising practices that will optimize student success and improve our retention and graduation outcomes among all of our students. And student success is everyone's job on this campus. While the academic exchange between faculty and student is essential and at the core of what we do, we know that there are other factors that can influence students' persistence, retention, and graduation. I had the opportunity to experience this three months ago when I interacted with some of the 5,200 students who graduated and more recently as I talk to alumni around the country. Each person has a different story of how their Cal Poly Pomona experience transformed their lives. What we do here matters. And certainly we appreciate the role of academic affairs to student achievement. We also make a collective contribution to student success. So to showcase our varied activities, I'm asking the Vice President to work with each of the offices, units, outside the academic departments and programs to identify at least one way they contribute to the student experience and to student success, and to display that contribution in a prominent location. Your role might be maintaining the landscape or solving a financial aid problem. Each one of us is an important part of the total student experience. And in order to look ahead and gauge how far we are from our goal, 
we must examine where we are today. As part of the strategic planning process, we will assess faculty and staffing needs and craft a multi-year plan to address them within the scope of our resources. We will continue to look at targeted hiring and increasing support of faculty and staff development. Additionally, we need to build upon our commitment to having a diverse and inclusive campus, not only among the students, but also among the faculty and staff. The fullness of knowledge can only be captured when diverse groups come together to share, exchange, and debate ideas. Allow me to quote from a paper on campus diversity published by the Association of American Colleges and Universities. Diversity is essential for excellence. Through diversity, the knowledge base that serves as the foundation of the academy becomes richer, more accurate, and more nuanced. Diversity also encourages a deeper understanding of our students and the ways in which their complex and dynamic identities influence what they learn and how they learn it. In these ways, diversity drives higher education towards excellence in teaching and learning. Before I leave the subject of strategic planning, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the individuals who were instrumental in preparing the institution's 2011-2015 strategic plan. I know the former provost, Martin Denbora, and, their, and the other vice presidents worked on the plan, but there were three people who deserve credit for integrating and organizing the information. Please join me in thanking Dr. Shant Shanti Srivnivas, Dr. Peter Kildoff, and Dr. Martin Sancho Midriz, who provided critical leadership in our past planning process. The results of the plan are posted on the Academic Affairs website. If those individuals are here, please stand and receive our thanks. In January, I shared my excitement about the great potential of this campus for education in the 21st century and the wealth of expertise that you, our faculty and staff bring to that process. I am convinced that when we connect our centers of excellence and achievement throughout the divisions and when we identify with clarity what makes this campus so special and build upon those strengths, together we will achieve eating even greater levels of excellence. Together we will harness and replicate the best of us and build an even more exciting future for this campus. I am also aware that your institutional journey to date has not been a straight and uneventful path, and neither will our next journey be without barriers, challenges, and stressors. But I believe that Cal Poly Pomona's 77 years of resiliency have emboldened us to meet whatever conditions may be forthcoming. Likewise, in joining you, I bring strength of determination, pride, and respect, along with a passion for who you are and what you stand for. And with that, a belief that we will scale the next heights of our journey and succeed together. Thank you and have a very successful fall quarter and a great academic year. And in talking about our direction for the journey forward, we need to first understand that path that we have taken and acknowledge our achievements thus far. Equally important is supporting this community. As a team, we celebrate individual successes because they magnify the entire community, 
Let us take this time to recognize outstanding people and programs and hear some of the highlights from this past year. Cal Poly Pomona plays a critical role in the transformation of students' lives. And not just our students, but also their families and their communities. The Social Mobility Index ranks Cal Poly Pomona fourth in the nation in helping graduates to create better lives. Kiplinger's Personal Finance Magazine places us among the top 100 public universities that blend quality and affordability. The 2016 rankings from U.S. News and World Report again ranks us among the top public universities in the West. In addition, the College of Engineering ranked 15th in the nation. Last year, we received hundreds of grants to further our scholarship and research, as well as to expand our support of underrepresented students. The College of Science secured over $6 million in federal grants, including $3.2 million to increase the number of underrepresented students pursuing doctoral degrees in physics and the biomedical field. The college also received $1.8 million to train students to protect our national infrastructure from cyber threats. The College of Engineering received $2.5 million from the federal government to promote graduate education in water conservation and sustainability. And the TRIO Arches program received $1.4 million to support low-income, first-generation, and disabled students. There are personal stories of giving as well. In the College of Engineering, alumnus Gunpat Patel and his wife, Manju, have given $1 million to upgrade the Engineering Projects Lab and create an endowment for a lecture series. The generosity of alumnus Ron Gregoire allows our students to have one of the best settings to learn, collaborate, and innovate. The university named Gregoire Hall as a way to acknowledge his gift of $2.5 million to the College of Business Administration. Donor gifts are funding the fourth building at the Collins College of Hospitality Management. The new building is scheduled to open at the end of the year. There are countless examples of student achievements. 2015 started on a high note when the Soaring Stories Rose Float won the award for Most Beautiful Non-Commercial Float. Our 2016 entry, Sweet Shenanigans, is bound to draw smiles and hungry eyes. Last year's National Model United Nations team became the most decorated in university history. They earned an Outstanding Delegation Award along with five individual awards. A team of architecture students won first prize in the Los Angeles Business Council's Julius Shulman Emerging Talent Award competition. They faced the five other architecture programs in the LA area, including USC and Cal State Long Beach. In the College of Agriculture, the Food Science Society received an outstanding chapter and organization growth trophy from the Institute of Food Technologist Student Association. Our student group was among three finalists for the Chapter of the Year Award. The College of the Extended University has been expanding its global education program. This year alone, more than 500 international students, educators, government officials, and other professionals participated in its training programs. The Affordable Learning Initiative, led by the University Library, has saved students about $5 million to date. The program collaborates with the Bronco Bookstore by providing alternative academic content. More than 250 faculty have participated. This summer, we hosted about 200 athletes and supporters for the Special Olympics World Games. The Student Affairs staff welcomed delegations from Laos, Poland, Libya, and the Isle of Man. The campus also hosted over 350 teachers as part of a statewide education summit. One of the guest speakers was Justin Lim, an alumnus and an instructional coach at Rosemead High School. He discussed integrating technology into K-12 classrooms. Several campus-wide events are coming up, including the annual Ink and Clay Exhibition in the W. Keith and Janet Kellogg University Art Gallery. The opening reception is Saturday afternoon. Also on Saturday, the LA County Fair is celebrating Cal Poly Pomona Day. Admission is free for students, faculty, and staff. Join us for the parade at noon and other performances and activities throughout the day. More information is available on Polycentric. The athletics season is in full swing. Our athletes, coaches, and staff are coming off their best year ever, capturing our first Commissioner's Cup for the CCAA Conference. On Friday, come out to cheer on the soccer teams as they face Cal State Dominguez Hills. 
Next Friday, the women's volleyball team plays Cal State San Marcos. Go Broncos! Good morning. I'm Sylvia Alva, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs. I'm very excited to be here and begin a new academic year together. I want to take this time to recognize all the new faculty and staff who are beginning a new year at Cal Poly Pomona. This year's group includes the president and myself. In all, we have 43 new tenure track faculty and 166 new staff members. You can identify the new faculty and staff by the green ribbon and the name tag that they're wearing. I recently discovered that these ribbons are a tradition on the campus and it is one of many I hope to learn about in the upcoming months. Now, would all of the new faculty and staff please stand and be recognized Thank you for welcoming us to the Cal Poly Pomona family. Each year, select university faculty are confirmed by their colleagues to earn the right of tenure thus becoming lifelong members of the university family. In 2015, 14 individuals received this honor, with some also earning promotion to professor or associate professor. Please stand and be recognized as your name is displayed, and let us hold the applause until the end. Congratulations to the faculty receiving tenure and promotion to professor. And now recognizing faculty receiving tenure and promotion to associate professor. Finally, congratulations to those receiving promotion to professor. Congratulations to all of you. I now have the honor of introducing the three winners of the Provost's Award for Excellence. These awards celebrate the great work of our faculty in three areas, teaching, service, and scholarly and creative activities. A symposium will be held next year on March 2nd. I hope you'll join us for this event. Now, let us honor the awardees. Jennifer Kitt. Switkiss from the Department of Mathematics and Statistics is honored for excellence in teaching. Winnie Dong, <laughs> Professor, <laughs> Winnie Dong, Professor in Chemical and Materials Engineering, is honored for excellence in science. Richard Wilson, Professor of Urban and Regional Planning, is honored for excellence in scholarly and creative activity. I would like to now invite Kathy Street to the podium as we recognize our outstanding advisors. Thank you, Sylvia. Good morning. My name is Kathy Street, and I'm the Acting Vice President for Student Affairs, and I'm very happy to be part of the fall conference this year. When we talk about the success of our students, 
we cannot discount the value and importance of advising. Faculty and staff advisors provide mentoring, they help students develop their career plan, they teach them how to navigate the university, and truly make a difference in the lives of our students. At this time, we would like to acknowledge the, the 2014-15 Outstanding Advisors of the Year. So as your name is announced, please stand up so we could recognize you. Amanda H. Padani. Ben DeWald. Brock A. Sandalin. Elkia Spetia. Gwen Yuri. Ian Carlson. Nancy M. Sanders. Sapita Ahadiat. Victor F. Okusen. Wei Jin Lin. Outstanding Program Awardee, University Housing Services, College Themed Learning Communities. Thank you, and congratulations to all the recipients. Staff are crucial to the operations and success of the university. They maintain the beauty of our campus, our buildings, our technology infrastructure. They've processed 10,000 applications. They ensure class registration, tuition payments, and financial aid disbursements go smoothly every year. And of course, they make sure that we all get paid on time each month. <laughs> so, without a doubt, we have excellent staff across the university. With that said, I'm proud to recognize four staff members who have been recognized for really going the extra mile. Please stand when your name is announced. Abel Zamora. <laughs> April Dawn. Joan Horn. Michelle McConnell. And congratulations to these recipients. At this time, we'd like to pause for a moment and remember friends and colleagues that we have lost this year. Thomas W. Spaulding. Wendy Naismith. Vaughn L. Lucas. Roger S. Bloomfield. Thank you. And at this time, I'd like to invite Profession Eskandare to the stage to announce the recipient of the George Hart Award. Thank you. As the chair of the Academic Senate, I have the privilege of announcing the recipient of the George P. Hart Award. Professor Hart taught in the political science department for 30 years, served on the Academic Senate for 10 years, more than two years as the chair of the Senate, and was also active in the system-wide academic senate. He cared deeply about the university's reputation and vigorously promoted faculty part participation in the shared governance of the university. The Hart Award recognizes faculty members who, in the tradition established by George Hart, are role models and leaders on campus and in the community. Unfortunately, George Hart passed away unexpectedly in 1995. However, his vision and passion live on as a reminder of what we all aspire to. In addition to the Hart Award that was established in his name, the Academic Senate has permanently memorialized Professor Hart by naming the Academic Senate offices after him. This year is the 20th anniversary of the Hart Award, and today, we are very happy that George's widow, Ms. Sandy Baldonado, is here with us. Before I announce this year's recipient, 
I'd like to invite Sandy to come and join me on stage to say a few words about Professor Hart. Thank you, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. This is a highlight of my year every year for this convocation. Um, you've heard a lot about George and how he was so devoted to this college. Um, this is the 19th recipient. Uh, the award was created at his death 20 years ago. First recipient was Peggy Perry. And uh, I've been here for, I think all of them except last year when I was out in the country. It is with great pleasure that I uh, am here for this award for a gentleman who really epitomizes George's interest in this college and in the community. He is so active in the community of Pomona, and I'm hoping to get him to be involved with Claremont as well. So without giving away any secrets, I will turn it back over to your president of the Academic Center. Thank you very much, Sandy. It is now my pleasure to announce that this year's Hart Award recipient is Dr. Kyle Brown from the College of Environmental Design. <laughs> Dr. Brown has served in the College of Environmental Design for 17 years, but his teaching, service, and leadership extend beyond the boundaries of this campus. He works closely with community groups and schools in Pomona, bringing K through 12 students to our campus for unique educational experiences related to environmental sustainability. He has secured grants, contracts, and gifts from many sources, including Aminex, Southern California Gas Company, the Boeing Foundation, and the Predi Foundation, just to name a few. As the director of the Lyle Center for Regenerative Studies, he's a leader in environmental sustainability, which as you know, is one of our core values at Cal Poly Pomona. Our excellent reputation in this area is in no small part because of Kyle's contributions. He was instrumental in helping the university obtain a STARS gold certification and in developing the campus's climate action plan. I have to say, however, that these accomplishments don't fully describe Dr. Brown. Other qualities of Dr. Brown that we've all come to know and respect are his solid character, sincerity, intellectual curiosity, leadership, and dedication to students. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Kyle Brown. <laughs> President Coley, Kyle and Sandy, would you please join me on stage? Well, thank you, Sepp, and thank you to all of you for being here today. I'm truly honored to be the 2015 recipient of the George P. Hart Award. This award is meaningful to me for many reasons. First and foremost, because it is awarded by my faculty peers, who I respect. Second, I know many of the past recipients and their colleagues whose work I've admired for many years. And third, the criteria reflect characteristics embodied by Professor Hart, which I value greatly. And I thank the selection committee for this honor. 
I often use a book in my courses written by Paul Schmitz entitled Everyone Leads, and Schmitz offers a definition of leadership which I like. He describes leadership as an action many can take as opposed to a position only a few can hold. He says leadership is not about being a hero that has all the answers, but rather about taking responsibility to work collaboratively with others toward establishing and achieving common goals. It is these types of leaders that I have the greatest respect for, and in my work, I strive to be recognized as a leader, not for the title or the degrees that I possess, but for the practice of values that engage groups to work effectively together to help others grow their own leadership. Now, one of the activities that I'm known for is the Regenerative Communities Fellowship Program funded by the Ernest Preddy Jr. Foundation. And this is a program we started three years ago, and we place Cal Poly Pomona students in classrooms in Westmont and Kellogg Elementary Schools here in Pomona. They teach environmental science, but the primary goal of the program is about illuminating pathways of opportunity for underrepresented students. And this is a conscious strategy of ours to really support regeneration of the community from within. And students in these schools face many challenges to their healthy development. Many have stories of poverty, immigration, language barriers, families with limited experience in formal education, and daily exposure to substantial pollution that is really among the worst in the state. My family and I live in Pomona, but frankly, a nerd-like, middle-aged man like myself, uh, the son of a university professor who comes from a very privileged background, is really a limited asset in helping these communities address such challenges. But our students here at this university are a tremendous asset in this regard. Many have their own stories of poverty, immigration, learning English as a second language, or being the first in their family to go to college. And our students face the same substantial pollution burdens. In fact, the state of California says they experience the highest pollution exposures of any student in the CSU. So they are well prepared to connect with these students in Pomona and model pathways of opportunity such as higher education or community activism. But beyond the success that we've seen with this program, I have to say it's impacted me on a very personal level. The Cal Poly Pomona students I work with are really an amazing group of individuals. The students, faculty, staff, and families at the schools are very welcoming. And this opportunity to contribute to the regeneration of the community in which I live and work has been really the greatest experience in my professional life. The other work I've been involved in recently is the climate action here on campus. And as Sepp mentioned, I was privileged to serve as chair of these efforts from 2007 to 2014. And we had many accomplishments and national recognitions during this period. But they were not the result of my efforts as chair, but rather a diverse group of people who took actions of leadership on important issues. They're the result of the student athlete who initiated and implemented zero waste basketball games here on campus, the faculty who integrated the topic of climate change into her course, the manager who worked to expand solar power production on campus, and the staff member who spent countless hours compiling the data for the purposes of reporting our sustainability progress. The entire campus community shared in these accomplishments, and we should, very, we should feel very good about our progress. Of course, much work remains. Climate change continues to be a pressing concern, and, and the substantial pollution burden faced by our campus, which I mentioned earlier, should be considered a serious risk to the health and well-being of our students and all of us. We need to continue to collectively exhibit leadership on these issues, and I, I hope that we do. Now, there are many individuals and groups to which I owe thanks for this recognition. I'm appreciative of those, such as former President Ortiz, who have created opportunities for me to grow my own leadership. I thank my students and my partners in the community for allowing me the opportunity to support their leadership growth. 
I thank my faculty and staff colleagues across the university, um, but particularly those connected to sustainability initiatives, to ENV and to the Lyle Center for their efforts. And a special shout out to the outstanding staff of the Lyle Center who are here today, uh, past and present, who actively support all of the work that we do in the community. And finally, I thank my family, my wife Betsy, who's here with us, for supporting and inspiring me to pursue service within our community. So one last thing I'll mention, I'm the organizer of a monthly community meetup that we call Pomona Green Drinks. And we gather each month at a wine bar in downtown Pomona to socialize and maybe talk about the environment and save the world one sip at a time. <laughs> our, uh, our September event is tomorrow night. And I know that presents a conflict with religious ob observations for some of you, and I apologize for that. But if you're interested, you can contact me for more information or find Pomona Green Drinks on Facebook. And tomorrow night only, if you come and use the code word Heart Award, <laughs> you will receive a moderately priced beverage of your choice. <laughs> Thank you. I hope to see you there. Hello everyone, I'm Esther Chow Tanaka, the Interim Director for Public Affairs. I'm excited to share some new projects and initiatives related to communications. We all know that our students live on their mobile phones const and constantly communicate through social media. Have you guys heard of Snapchat? This is a social media network that reached 4 billion daily video views. It has 100 million users and just under half of them are between the ages of 18 and 24. So that means that on average, each person is, a watch, is watching about 40 short videos a day. Our students expect our communications to also be immediate and relevant. As a university, we must balance those expectations with our resources, as well as the need to provide accurate and thoughtful communications. With that said, I'm excited to share some new developments. Next month, a new Cal Poly Pomona mobile app will be available on iTunes and Google Play. Students will be able to view their class schedule, check grades, and register for classes. It also has news, maps, and information about campus events. More features are in development. We will soon introduce a new tool for students called Portfolium that will allow them to showcase their coursework, projects, and portfolium. They can connect with potential employers, collaborate on projects and ideas, and network with other students and alumni. Think of it as LinkedIn for students with an element of alumni engagement. Portfolium is launching across the CSU, and best of all, it will be free to all students and alumni. More information will be coming soon. So mobile apps and new social networks are exciting, but I want to remind everyone about our existing communication resources. Polycentric and Poly Updates are the main vehicles for campus happenings and university news announcements. But if you want to comment on campus happenings, our social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn are lively forums for the entire campus community. For emergency situations, the safety alert system will send messages to phones, email addresses, and campus-owned computers. I encourage all of you to update your contact information in Bronco Direct and include your cell phone number so you'll get text alerts during an emergency. More information is available on the safety alert. More information about the safety alert system is available on the safety website. Finally, we're encouraging President Coley to communicate with the campus in new ways. As part of her listening tour, she filmed two video conversations with Professor David Speak and past ASI President James Cox. We plan to continue these video conversations with students, faculty, staff, alumni, and community partners. In addition, President Coley will be joining us on social media. <laughs> yeah. Details will be coming soon, so stay tuned. Now, please welcome back Dr. Eskandari, who will close convocation. It's 
been a great morning. Um, I'd like to thank all of you again for joining us this morning at Convocation. After this event, we'll immediately start the service awards ceremony right here in Ursa Major. Um, I hope you'll stay and celebrate the, the successes of our friends and, and colleagues. This afternoon and for the next few days, there will be college and division meetings, as well as workshops about key university initiatives, including semester conversion, uh, student success, advising, and high impact practices. Uh, later this afternoon, from 4 to 6 p.m., President Coley and her husband Ron will host a reception for all faculty and staff at the Manor House. However, if it rains, the reception will be held right here in Ursa Major. I am told that you should all expect an email at 3 p.m. that will confirm the location of the reception. Um, this is an exciting time for Cal Poly Pomona. I am very excited, energized, and ready to work with all of you. With your talent and hard work and our shared vision for student success, I am sure that we can all work together and accomplish so much together this year. Again, welcome to the 2015-2016 academic year. Let's have a wonderful and productive year together. Thank you.